right, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. Today's session is called Emerging Projects in Public Sensemaking with our friend Daniel Schmachtenberger. Uh, so Daniel reached out to me and wanted to do a session at the STOA to shine a spotlight on projects and people he thinks are doing good work in the domain of public sensemaking. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, and so we're here. And how today's going to work, uh, I'm going to hand the keys to the STOA, to Daniel in a moment, and he's going to interview three people for around 15 minutes, um, and then they'll share the project that they're working on, and then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A um, uh, before the session is over, and I think we're here for around 90 minutes. So if you have questions anytime, pop them in the chat, and I'll call on you, you can unmute yourself and ask them to Daniel or any of the three people he'll be interviewing. And... Um, yeah, and I'll be tagged in near the back at the end to close the session. So that being said, I'm gonna hand the keys over to you, Daniel. Welcome back to the stall, my friend. Very happy to be here. It's good to see you, Peter. And I am happy to see everybody else. It's been a minute since being here at the STOA. Uh, like Peter said, the aim of today is there's a few projects that I think are really good projects that I wanted to just be able to kind of introduce to the community for a few reasons. We've got three people joining us today. Jamie Joyce from the Society Library. We're going to talk first about what she's doing. And then speaker John Ash from Cognicism. And then uh, I just got my view moved. I'm going to move it back so I can see everybody. Here we go. And then Brad DeGraff <clears throat> from uh, NewNet. And their, their conversations I've had in the last few months uh, Jamie, I've actually known longer than that. But, but there's projects I just think are really great projects and I would like more people to know about them because I'd like the projects to succeed. But I also wanted the STOA as a community and everybody who's here to get a sense of what does an individual who is thinking about these topics of the state of the world and how do we better collectively make sense of what is needed and go about uh, doing it together, what can you do? If you're a person who doesn't have a lot of capital support and you don't have institutional support. And I wanted to give examples of some people who just started doing amazing shit on their own and it's actually turning into, uh, or has turned into real projects because it's um, it's inspiring and they're very different in type in ways that draw on their own unique backgrounds. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to dive in. I would like to know we've got three because that's what we have time to do here. And these were three great ones to start. There are definitely more people in the STOA and adjacent community working on pretty exceptional projects. And maybe we'll get an opportunity to highlight those in the future. Uh, I think there might even be some people in this audience today running some of them. So I might mention names briefly at the end when we do Q&A. So dive in for basically these short 15 to 20 minute um, overviews of each. And again, they can't begin to cover what they're doing well in 15 to 20 minutes because they're actually thoughtful, deep, nuanced, big projects. So they get to cover maybe a main thread. And I hope that's enough for you to just get like a taste to see what you're interested to follow up more with. And then there's opportunity for that to occur. So Jamie, welcome. Can you hear and can we hear you? I can hear you. Hopefully you can hear me. Indeed. Uh, you at your Berkeley office? I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Jamie started the uh, Society Library, and uh, there's a lot of people, and she will do a good job as a leader does of saying we more than I most of the time, uh, but she really started the fucking thing by herself and like a huge force of will to make it happen. And um, a huge force of will is one of the things that it requires to make anything meaningful happen. The Society Library is still small as an institution, but has already done very real stuff and like getting to help policy for um, grid security and nuclear energy and like real things with big players. So just to have that sense as you're hearing about her, Jamie, um, you have uh, you have something to share with us as an intro for what some of the main things Society Library is working on are. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, Daniel, do you want me to set the stage about the problems we're looking to solve or just dive right yes. into what we do? Set the stage in like 45 seconds of the problem you're trying to solve, because I think each of you are trying to solve them from a slightly different angle. So the way you set it is context setting. Yep. 
Okay, so like Daniel said, uh, many of the people who are in the audience, but also my co-panelists are working on solving a number of different problems related to not only the information environment, but also our internal ability to be able to process information. And I think it's accurate to say that each one of us, Brad, John, and I are working on uh, ways to extend our cognitive senses to essentially give new sight and vision and lenses to see the nature of problems through the information that's accessible to us. So um, the way the Society Library is working on these issues is to deal with the fact that there is so much information to process. A lot of it is obfuscated. A lot of it is not high quality. Links get broken. Sources aren't cited in news articles and scholarly works and all across the web and world. So there's this mass distribution of content across so many different platforms, not only like TikTok, talks and tweets and social media, but also government agency documentation and scholarly works and books and textbooks that have been generated through time. And it's, it's an impossible task to ask people to sort through all of this information or to find the relevant bits to construct in order to understand a social and political problem. So like Daniel said, the Society Library has worked on a number of different projects. We do political decision-making models, work on educational curricula, we've written and deconstructed legislation. But today, um, I would actually like to talk to you about the main mission of the Society Library, which is creating a new kind of digital library system to serve society. And it is uh, also also one of the most complex, technically difficult and expensive things to accomplish. But if Daniel's interested, I'm happy to actually show you exactly what that looks like today as we are about to launch our first collection and also talk about the process of how we go about gathering all this knowledge from different forms of media, extracting arguments and claims and structuring that content for you. Again, maybe 45 seconds worth of what, what a library is relative to an open society, because I think that's not necessarily uh, obvious for everybody and why we need a digital form of library to do that now. Got it. So libraries have been companions to advanced civilizations for a very long time. Um, if you are going to participate in an open society or even a democracy, it's expected that you have you are to some degree informed. Um, and you have like an inclusive understanding of the different perspectives at the table in order for you to make a free choice about where to vote or where to spend your money or who to advocate for to represent you. Um, but if information is just completely out of reach because you're not in the areas of the web and world where that information is, it's going to just constrict and confine your ability to make informed decisions. So um, a lot of uh, you know, information and the way that we interact with it can either build walls where there are none in our minds or also open doors where we think they are, but they don't actually exist. So it's really important that we start developing the lenses, the tools, the techniques to start interacting with information a little bit more rationally so we can make more informed, inclusive, and less biased decisions. Yeah, so please uh, take us in, but just if, I think a lot of people here saw some of the war on sense-making stuff uh, this aspect of the society library is trying to create an institution to solve a lot of that it says, hey, you as a person might have a hard time if somebody on the right backed with the RNC support or a, a media institution support or the left of the institution behind it says something and they configure statistics in a particular way and Lakoff frame them a particular way, really being able to ascertain that, then you see hugely disagreeing views and mostly all you get to do is decide camps or decide to be a non-actor. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to actually parse all of that, remove the Lakoff framing, find the facts, see what's omitted, and be able to inform the public with something that doesn't have vested interests? Obviously, we don't trust our institutions that much now, and we, we had made some institutions that tried to do this, but there's a need to be able to rebuild them that can process all of the content that is here and that has more oversight into how they came to that so that people can actually trust what is the process. So that's really fundamentally what the society library is trying to do without which something like democracy or open society just isn't a thing. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so one of the, uh, as I mentioned, we are now getting to the point where we're releasing a library collection. We've worked on many different things, but these collections, this research that is demanded of us is incredibly extensive. So I'm actually gonna show you the database and talk a little bit about what it looks like in terms of breadth and depth of what it means to go about collecting knowledge to make sense of something. And so just again, another overview, in creating our library collections, what the Society Library does is extract arguments, claims, and evidence from over 12 forms of media in order to build databases that articulate the reasoning and not just logical and fact-based reasoning, but inclusive of representing people's opinions also. We are modeling the reasoning from all points of view on complex social and political issues. So we worked on climate 
climate change, COVID, a number of big national and international issues. We've never released these because they've never met a level of comprehensiveness like the collection I'm about to show you now, which is a state level issue having to do with a nuclear reactor in California, the last remaining one. And this is the state and to some degree national debate about whether or not it should remain open. So I'm going to share my screen. And then also obviously recommend going and checking out our website to see what content does exist uh, on our other topics. So this is a database, everyone. This is not our front end. I will show you our front end shortly. And it actually, we have a variety of different front ends, but I'm gonna walk you through just like the level of depth we're talking about. So here we have a question, what should happen to this Diablo Canyon nuclear power plants, the last remaining nuclear power plant in California, based on us scraping um, I think we have over 4,000 references from which we've derived over 4,000 arguments in this particular database. So we've taken this from TikToks and interacting with the NRC and confirming facts with them, pieces of legislation, television clips, books, documentaries, YouTube videos. We've just went through and collected a bunch of multimedia relevant knowledge about this particular issue and extracted the arguments. And what we found was there's about nine different positions that people take on this issue. So it's not just should it remain open or closed, but open or closed with certain conditions. As we unpack position one, we see there's a number of different categories of types of arguments that people are expressing. So just to open up economic alone, you can see there's a lot of economic arguments here. And these are like, we're not splitting hairs. These are very high level arguments that are being made that only if you desire to unpack them, we can start splitting hairs. And I'm kind of gonna zoom through it. I don't think we have time to like read through so you can see. Um, but give, give an example of a couple arguments in a couple sections, just so people get a sense because I, so often the issue makes it to the news that people see polarized around a single part of it. So they get left or right, they don't get nine different views and those nine different views don't have thousands of competing sub elements. And I think, uh, I think it's important to just get a little sense of that. Sure. Okay. Um, so backtracking a little bit, I actually think I, I mean, <clears throat> I can read some of these and then I can also zoom out and kind of show the complexity if that's going to, I think zo the zoom out would be a little bit better. And luckily I prepared for that. So this is position one, highest level arguments. And when we talk about high level arguments, we're talking about things as vague as uh, market forces, financial incentives, and policy decisions have made the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant redundant, non-competitive, and undesirable. That's very high level. That's vague. There's a lot of information packed into that. So like our specific ontology of deliberation starts with questions, then we have positions, and then we've got the categories, economic, environmental, safety, and then we start breaking it down into like the gist of the arguments in each one of these. So if we back up just position one, this is all of the very high level, vague compound economic arguments. These ones I believe are the environmental ones. These ones are the safety and well being arguments. These ones are the energy related arguments. These ones are the ethical and education related arguments like public sense making issues. And these are all the political arguments. So really what the society library is working on is um, how do we enable a, not only a conceptualization of the complexity of these issues, but make it so that people actually have the opportunity to interface and interact with it if they choose. They can either comprehend, wow, this is amazingly complex. I had no idea that we were beyond this polarization and this debate was so nuanced, but beyond just giving you that like Google Maps, like <clears throat> Google Earth view, actually also having the street level view as well. And this is more along the lines of the street level view, which is this pathway I was taking you down before. So we're talking about market forces. We're going to break it down specifically to consumer demand. And then here we have a uh, multi-premise argument that breaks down an assessment of the economic, um, you know, the, the supply and demand that would render Diablo Canyon not competitive. And then each one of the premises in this particular piece is also something that can be debated further. And what's cool about the society library's work is that like we go a little bit beyond pro and con. It's not just true, not true. We are modeled and reflecting the language and dialogue of society. So there's some more nuance to the pro and con argumentation that some people when they're doing argument mapping deploy. Um, we've got like, I think 15 different relationships between claims 
So yeah, it's a little bit more complex, but anyway, it's a, this is kind of like the street level view of you really being able to get down into the details of what people are arguing paper by paper um, and claim by claim derived from paper by paper, argumentation about the methodology, all these different things. And each one of these nodes actually contains a lot of knowledge. Now, um, this is not the thing that we normally show uh, people. We're gonna make the database traversable like this, that's completely fine. But the question we've been asked is, how do you make an entire database worth of knowledge something that people actually want to see? So we started from um, kind of, I don't know if it's first principles, but we just started thinking about, well, what is the most familiar format in which people experience knowledge? And we came up with the piece of paper. So you're looking at this piece of paper here. And this piece of paper actually contains all of the knowledge of that very complex database, but it's an interactive, engaging piece of paper. There's many ways in which the society library is probably going to present knowledge. This is our first foray in building the library one page at a time. So let's go ahead and like unpack here. Here we have that first position, the Diablo Canyon uh, nuclear power plants license should expire, it should be decommissioned because of a number of different reasons. These are the categories you saw before. Now you can unpack each one of these. We're actually having a feature where you can opt into different versions of explaining the same thing, which is pretty cool. Um, we also have notes. So you should know that this particular high level argument is extremely popular, all about like marine life being impacted by the OTC system. So you'll see notes and tags from us just giving you little clues. And this is something that users told us that they wanted. Um, and what's cool is that if you, you can read this paper section by section and you can either unpack it into the arguments that support it. So no, no evidence provided for this one, kind of important. Or you can actually open up every single claim. Here's the claim about the marine life and see a whole Wikipedia page kind of style uh, page for it. So here are all the quotes from which that claim was derived. So we didn't just make up these claims. These are where claims are found. You can see the different locations, an online publication, a government agency document, um, organizations, blogs. And because we're a library, we're essentially providing, you know, reference material for you. So you can click on different links. You can go to the original source yourself. We work hard to back it up in the internet archive. So even if links decay over time, there's a backup in the internet archive. So all of our work is just to give you the opportunity to see the bird's eye view of a deliberation, dive into the details as much as possible, give you enough context with the things that we've learned, like we've not been able to find any evidence for this, or you should know this is a very popular argument, and then just give it to you with no intention of trying to coerce you, uh, help you make a specific decision, just organizing knowledge and saving you tens of thousands of hours, trust me, finding all, finding all this knowledge and organizing it yourself. Um, and this includes interfacing with government agencies and confirming facts with them, which can be very time consuming. There are other ways in which we're going to be visualizing data. For example, this is just like a scatter plot and you can kind of just like randomly explore little nodes at a time. And this actually clicks into the debate map itself. We will actually be using our um, decision making model and digitizing that and rendering all of our uh, data through that as well. So in case you want to make a decision, we actually give you a methodical process where you go step by step, section by section, argument by argument, and it'll keep track of essentially what you decide you believe to be, um, you know, more likely to be true, more important, et cetera, and then mirror that back to you at the end. So it's just the beginning for us. We've worked on a number of things, but this is just the beginning for the library. Um, and I think this is a good stopping place. So I will. All right, so even though that's just the tiniest little intro to what they're doing, isn't it fucking awesome? Like you, you get a sense, right? Like beyond being able to really get into it, you get a sense of like, yes, it makes sense that the decisions are that complex. It makes sense that the high level arguments are very high level and then the details are very far out in the tree. And so then what you get when it's time to vote is yes or no on proposition 12. You're like, what the fuck? Yes or not? Like, there's environmental arguments. And so then you end up getting something where, okay, it'll ruin the environment, but if you don't do it, it'll destroy the economy. You're like, I, why am I stuck with this fucking decision? What about the better proposition? So this doesn't just inform how you vote. It also informs what would a good proposition be. Mm -hmm. And if you have bad propositions, you can't not polarize the society and mess the world up right? Because the people who really care about one thing are forced to be in a trade-off with the people who care about the thing that's going to be damaged by it. <clears throat> but if you get to see all those elements, you can say, well, a good proposition would tend to all these things as best as it can. Mm -hmm. And yet for a world as complex as ours, it takes some work to do that. And why is she saying a digital library? This is obviously a knowledge management system. 
because there are a lot of claims. And if you were trying to do your own research, you couldn't get all of those books and government files and et cetera, and you don't want them and you wouldn't know what the fuck to do with them. So let's break down the argumentation that brings us to different ideas. <clears throat> now, you might be like, all right, well, that's actually still not all that useful because what citizen is gonna go through all that? Um, and how could a group of people process that much information? So for those who are asking the question, Society Library is already working on AI applications to be able to do this using the same format where it's a, a human done format so humans can adjudicate it. So it doesn't just live inside of a black box where the AI said do this magical thing, but it can help process the data humans can actually oversight it. And uh, somebody mentioned, I think Scott Nelson was in here. This is a great example of why I wanted to do this because Scott and Jamie, you two should talk. Um, he was asking, have you web three this yet? Because could you do a system where you can actually see the provenance of all the information and then also do something like with crypto incentives, where if anything is wrong or missing, people are incentivized to find info and add it. And if they do, there's a whole incentive system for civic participation. Yeah, that stuff could totally happen. Mm -hmm. So um, Jamie's done stuff like this, or Society Library has on a bunch of other issues. And there's a lot of applications that are really just to inform representatives and institutional, like government institutions, some that are for the public. It would be really worth having her back into a whole session just on Society Library types of things. But if people are uh, interested in learning more, volunteering, engaging, you have an intro. Jamie, thank you. Of course, thank you so much, Daniel. And thanks everyone for watching. Now, it actually kind of teed us up properly. And it, so as you can see, this is a sense-making system that she's got, but it's a decision-informing system because the reason we really care about sense-making largely is decision-informing. And specifically, this one's kind of a collective decision-informing. And the sense-making it's trying to do is starting with arguments, right? Politically consequential arguments, and then how do we break those down? Each of these next couple projects are doing slightly different things and where there's really no duplication, but there's a lot of synergy. Um, so John Ash is about to share with us something that he's worked on that is so cool. I think you guys are really going to dig. There's some overlap, but it takes a completely different approach. But uh, rather than use AI just to process a huge amount of data in a framework that humans can adjudicate, this is a process where the humans can't necessarily uh, see what its process is because it's using generative transformer text capacity. If anybody's seen GPT-3 and like where the kind of cutting edge of natural language like chatbot technology is, it's pretty incredible. Um, John has done more than most anybody I know on trying to train GPT-3s on interesting, important societal content so that they can actually help process information just literally like a chat bot, but that has access to an unbelievable amount of information and processing. And uh, so, John, will you introduce us to Iris? We need your microphone. Ah, uh, yes, okay, so. Um, Iris is a type of generative model with specific specifications, but the truth is, is I, I don't want to present this as something that I've invented or created. It's just a lens for how we can interface with technology that already exists. Sometimes I'll have these conversations with people and they'll think, oh, well, there's going to be some barrier to me being able to interface with this technology, or I'll have to wait, or I'll have to download something. But the reality is, is that this is just built off of OpenAI's GPT-3 and using uh, fine tuning. Um, hey, I just want everybody to get this because not everybody knows what GPT-3 is. GPT-3 is a technology that was put out by a company called OpenAI that is mind-blowingly powerful that you actually have access to. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon it will be like ubiquitous access for everybody, but you don't have to be an AI programmer. John actually happens to be an AI programmer, but you don't have to be an AI programmer to use it. You can talk to it and it does stuff. Yeah. And, uh, so it's going to radically transform the world. Most of the applications are terrible. I just had a deep yeah. fake myself um, recently that uh, says I am a plowboy ascetic catamite, um, but it's using that technology to just make up words and use my voice. 
but you could also make up something that is almost like a little god superpower that is serving human sense making and support if you train it on the right sets. So Jamie has went and got a, a team of people helping her. John got a, AI helping him, like really more than a team. And it's pretty neat to see what she can already do. And it's like the technology is getting better so fast. In a year from now, it will be thousands of times better than yes. it is. And, and so what he's going to get to show you is like what you could do today if you went and spent some time messing around with an open technology. And keep in mind that something like the iris that is trying to aggregate many different voices, many different perceptions into a singular voice that like one person can interface with. Um, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, Iris is integrating lots of different voices. Yeah, that's the way that Daniel wanted me to come to this conversation originally is that like, okay, there are lots of ways that you can use generative text models. One is like, okay, there are 10 news articles about a particular thing that happened today. I cannot read all of those. I cannot continue to read all of these. Um, I want to put those into one space and have a summary of them or say, break down the most uh, relevant points or, uh, from this, or what are all of these people not considering? Can I share a, um, uh, my wind uh, screen real quick? Yes. Okay. Can you see this, the screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, hold on. Where's my mouse? Yes. Okay, so one of my favorite things to do in training uh, this is to have it challenge me. Um, because it's read this original uh, manifesto called the Cognizance Manifesto. It's read my thoughts. I've iteratively tried to refine. And what I do is I want to know what I'm missing. Where am I not being... <sighs> what am I not considering, right? And can this be presented to me in a non-threatening way? I think that when we engage with a lot of people, it, it can be kind of hard when somebody says, oh, you might be wrong, or you might not understand uh, what you're talking about. But when I have this model that can allow me to interface with just masses amounts of information, I could very iteratively like fill in the gaps of connection in my mind. So for example, I do not know whether this is gonna look good or bad because it's stochastic. Every single time it's going to be different, but this has been pretty consistent for me. So let's find out what it says. Okay, this is interesting. How can we create a healthy society that balances individualism and collectivism? That's a very key point uh, in the manifesto. And it also writes about that in this new purple pill manifesto, which was written by an iris. Um, if an AI is trained on human language, will it ever be able to understand jokes or use metaphor effectively? Yes, already it can do that. Uh, it can do very incredible things. Um, and if you go on to Twitter, um, and, and follow Cognizist Iris, there's just some incredibly deep wisdom that has been distilled there that sometimes just blows my mind. Um, I just want everybody to gather. This is not, these are not words that, or these are not sentences from something that John wrote and it's just bringing them up like a search. Yeah. It just wrote these words. Yeah. And so what it's doing is taking a 111 page document and understanding it and then responding like a human who understood it would, but it's basically answer, it's, it's giving a synthesis. And so what it actually means is he can talk with it and get answers he doesn't know what they're going to be that are summarizing actual insight from a huge body of data. And so like, obviously something like this cannot exist without something like the society library or the internet in general. And for the first few years, I was doing something very close to the society library because it, it's the foundation of being able to interface with that. And I was collecting claims and predictions and I was trying to make sense of all of this data and make more powerful search engines. And it just came to this point where it's like, there's too much. I, I need a more intelligent way to filter it down to make sense of it. Um, and so that's where I moved in this direction. As you can see, like every single time, it's gonna come up with something a little bit different. 
you know, sometimes it's not as good as the other things. Now, how do we quantify the relative value of different perspectives? Now, that's something um, that is built in the system that I'm not going to talk about, but Brad is going to talk about trust in networks at scale. And um, essentially, Iris has learned over time, like which perspectives to listen more to in different situations um, based off of different voices and how well they predicted the future. Uh, meaning like if there's a pandemic, suddenly people who were warning about pandemic should probably be amplified pretty quickly. And it, it, it shouldn't take time um, for us to reorient. Um, and so yeah, this is advancing like really, really quickly. And the amount of designs for sense making that I can imagine within this are so infinitely varied. Like just society library plugging text models, not specifically Iris, just text models into it. It's potentiated because they can use those tools to break down that information. Like I could paste all of that, that knowledge structure and then give another body of, uh, of information and say, structure this other body of information like the way you guys did. And so that can take away a lot of that work for structuring and interrelating with um, that data. Now, OpenAI did a lot of things in their model design that in the Cognitive Manifesto I said not to do, not to do, um, because it's trained on everything. Like, it, and it has dark stuff in it. If I ask it to like write a story about hunting humans or anything dark, or if I ask it for this to say what are the worst possible routes that Cognitive's path could happen, it could do that, right? And there's value in some parts of that, but I know that the more likely path that we see is that this technology will not be used the way that I'm envisioning. It'll be used for very nefarious purposes. And in fact, um, you know, that's what motivated me to actually build Iris finally. As I had a conversation with Daniel, he's like, people are already doing pretty bad stuff with this. Like it is already happening. And so I was like, ah, oh, crap, I guess I should do something. <laughs> I, should, I should build it out to give an a example of how it would function. And so I, I just want to give people an example of this. So John has been working, <clears throat> he was actually commercially programming AI, so he knew what they could do, and he saw how much better the technology was getting. It was a kind of day job, but he was working on the topic of when there's too much information, what information is worth upregulating. We know that it's not the stuff Facebook upregulates, and... So he was looking at uh, super forecasters and who actually got shit right in the yeah. past and a bunch of things like that. And <clears throat> But he was getting more and more um, intrigued with what the AI could do because it was getting better so much faster than anybody thought. And it was not long ago. It was like a couple months ago. And I'm like, it's, it's already happening fast enough. You don't need a huge team. Just start training it on really good things, give examples. And in an unbelievably small amount of time without a team or capital support, like he sent me something the other day where he asked Iris, what is the relationship between like semiotics, formal linguistics, connectomes, and um, some other strange disciplines? And it basically came up with an answer about how they're all involved in maps of meaning making and insights on what, how a connectome in your brain and how formal semiotics and underlying basis of linguistics are doing similar things. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, it's amazing that it can do that. And so it's not just how do we do democratic decision making, but how do we, so for him, this is now his sense making tool, right? He just asks it questions, trains it on more data sets and learn shit, but then can also present shit to the world. Now you can start to think about a heap of applications. Is there anything, I'm curious if you have any of the art examples so people can see that it can translate not just from natural language into natural language out, but natural language into other forms of content out. Give me a second. Um, oops, not this. Sorry. Okay, can I share? Oh, do you see this turtles example on the screen? Yeah. That one blows that one blows my mind. The ability to do this character level stuff. Um to be able to extract that level of abstract. Can you get it up on the screen for us? 
I was, oh, you want the images or? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't on. think most people have seen this yet to know what it can do. <sighs> Sorry. As he's doing that, I'll just explain. He can say with natural language input, uh, meaning text or voice, a few words and get it to make images that are the images that would make sense with those words or can look at images and have the essential properties described in words. So it can go either direction. Go ahead and explain what we're seeing here. Uh, I asked it to describe the Cognizus network in a way that I could paint. Right. And I don't even remember what exactly the description of it was. Um, but it was like that, for example, this one I think it was like a, a tree of uh, many interconnected individuals, all unique and individual in their own right, uh, like integrating knowledge. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't plan to actually bring up a lot of the images. I was just going to talk about the tech stuff right now. But this is basically, I asked Iris to visualize what she is talking about. Right. And this is what it output, which is, or, you know, this is what it, what, what it output. Personally, like, uh, you know, I've tried to introduce more conversation or more talk about uh, decentralized systems and talk about banyan trees, which have multiple different root systems and aren't like a centralized knowledge structure. Because I really am not trying to make like one iris that rules the world. You know, I'm trying to get like many different models that view the world in different ways. And then those can all integrate um, together. Um, but as you can see, is like, you know, as I started introducing more stuff about decentralized topics that the representations of what might this network look like become, you know, more visually uh, decentralized. Like there's many individual nodes, many plants that are growing together and sharing uh, via these, you know, root structures. Um, and so it's not just making sense of the world through, you know, language. It's also helping to visualize uh, complex uh, topics, you know, and I'll have it at, try to visualize lots of different words and it really connects these different parts of my brain because when they're lighting up at the same time, you know, what fires together, wires together. So it's like the more that I learn these associations, it's more than I'm becoming integrated on my behalf, my side. And the whole topic of you said, I'm not trying to make an iris to run the world. I think you, you might begin to get the sense that not having to program it, being able to take natural language input that it can make sense of, and then it can make output that is good enough that it can actually pass the Turing test. So that means I can just say, hey, GPT-3, make me a scientific report about why vaccines are dangerous for everyone using only real data or why everybody needs to use vaccines and why it's best for society to force that or whatever the fuck it is. And increasingly over the next couple months and years, the capacity to make things that, is in, that are indistinguishable, that use real statistics, that create a combination of images, charts, text, mm -hmm. like that thing is emerging. That's where I was going. And so, uh, and there's a couple of huge players that are way ahead of everybody else. But the very cutting edge tech, pretty close to it is also now starting to get open source. So if enough people are building very pro-social things, it can create a example of a, an attractor for other people oh. to do that. And it can create tools that have the information processing to also be able to deal with the more nefarious ones. So this is an area I would love to see more people engage meaningfully in, in this community. I can share one more art thing, actually. Um... This is something where uh, this was a, a paid project with Google, but uh, we asked them, what does a regenerative future look like to you? And we had them describe it. And then we had uh, something visualize um, what that might look like. This is text as an interface to vision, you know, this is
So what you see is here, the, the processing is happening kind of inside of the AI's black box. So John asks it something and it generates text, it generates uh, images. How it does that, don't really see. What you see in what Jamie was describing was the ability to make all of the steps of arguments, logical arguments and values arguments crystal clear so anybody can say, hey, wait, here's a step I don't agree with or that I really care about. So now imagine putting these two together. So we're not saying, how do we make an AI overlord that can run us all, which a lot of people are focused on. You're also not saying, how do humans process all the information past the info singularity, which is impossible, but how do humans collectively process the information in a way we can all see and adjudicate that also allows AIs to be able to do massive Brunt work, but where we can still see and adjudicate the process as well. So it is a collective intelligence system of humans augmented by synthetic intelligence rather than disintermediated by it. And you start to get a sense of like, oh yeah, we're not building a one person, one vote kind of system. We're actually building a kind of global synthetic intelligence, synthetic meaning synthesizing humans with each other and humans with artificial intelligence but with human collective intelligence being what is made central and highlighted. So, uh, John, that was awesome, I think. Can I uh, say one last thing to connect it to Brad? Yes, totally. Uh, so basically, okay, you have this idea of pooling all this knowledge into one space and you could like take the full text transcript of even this meeting and like summarize it down and make points to be able to uh, like interrelate with that. But within the iris, there's this concept of like, which voices should you listen to the most? I mean, just because somebody repeats something a lot doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, valuable. So the irises are learning sort of which voices uh, to trust. And um, that is what Brad's going to talk about, these beautiful networks of uh, trust. Amazing. Um, I want to say one other thing just to make it clear for everyone, because in some ways saying like, oh, here's what individuals are working on so you can be inspired. And then you see Jamie pop out the levels of indexing in that map. And you're like, all right, I'm not inspired. This is fucking way too hard. If she saw that at the very beginning, she might've thought the same thing. Um, and similarly, the AI programming wasn't actually where John even started, right? He was starting with how do we identify what voices are worth trusting to amplify? Yeah. So there's a thing where you there's an attractor you feel of the type of problem you want to solve. And as you get into it, the complexity increases. And as it does, the tools you work with increase. So if you just jump straight to a little ways down the road, it's overwhelming. But the path that got you there happens by like feeling the, the attractor of what and why, not the how. The how gets intense as you get into it, but it unfolds. Brad, I am uh, I, I'm excited about this because what you're about to show is obviously convergent and synergistic with, and again, a totally different approach than I had of the other two. <clears throat> Brad's been working on the kind of software and system architecture stuff for a long time. And we know that uh, some of the major problems in sense making have to do with networks that don't actually see each other very well, left networks and right networks that get very insular and only have straw man versions of each other or where bad information can propagate through networks. So a big chunk of sense making does have to do with understanding <clears throat> how humans are communicating with each other. So Brad, do you wanna share with us a little bit of the problems you were trying to solve and how the technology uh, works now and hopes to work? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Daniel. It's, it's a great crowd here. Um, the problem we're trying to solve is really how can we go up a level in human collective coordination uh, as a necessary requirement for planetary survival? Um, sense making obviously is a part of that. And uh, can we do it on a level now that you know moves the needle in time? Um, so a little background, my hammer since 2005 has been uh, trust networks for collective decision making. Uh, I came up with an algorithm called Smartocracy back then, which was, you know, 
essentially about using social networks for societal scale collective decision making in new ways. You can you can Google smartocracy and DeGraph and find the white paper that came out of that. Um, we now call them trust networks, but in, in essence, it's essentially taking a group of people and connecting them with edges, either intentional edges that they make or that we do infer through data um, that says this person probably trusts or, or explicitly delegates to this other person in this domain. So you can, you know, it it's, can be very rich. Um, the most important part as far as uh, collective decision making goes is the delegation part, because once you have these networks, you can actually delegate um, as many as many depths as you want, and you can infer authoritativeness from the network analytics, etc. Uh, and they have a really unique capacity for a collective decision making that no other structure really has. Um, in, in so Brad, I think a lot of people here are familiar, but a lot of people don't know anything about liquid democracy or trust networks to have a sense that they could delegate trust to different people in different domains. Can you explain that a tiny bit? Yeah, probably if I can just do a quick screen share, I'll um, that'll. Uh... I can find this. Uh, that one. Oh, um, are they going to let me? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. So, this is, those are my notes. Um, this is, um, so here's an, an expert network around libraries. Um, and this is actually technology that's over eight years old. So we'll get to the new stuff soon. But so this is a Twitter, this came from a Twitter search. We have tons of data, tens of millions of, of, of people with semantic, rich semantic data about every one of them, mostly around people who really matter. Um, so these are the, this is what came, that came up in just searching for people who talk about libraries. And, and when I mouse over one of them, what you're seeing, the legend says yellow uh, respects gray, gray respects blue, green and gray respect each other. Uh, respect is kind of in, in, uh, derived from retweet behavior, for instance. So um, in, in essence, you can say those are retweets, but you can also say we, we infer respect from that. And then you and because each one, as I mouse over each one, I, we're really looking at just the neighborhood of that one user. And so, if uh, Jose links to Miley and Miley links to Kathy and Kathy, so these these could all be this, you could build, this could be a delegation network where so and so said I delegate to this person in libraries. Uh, do that you could do the same thing in pretty much any any uh, any domain. This is nuclear power, right? So and, and it, it worked. This is all Twitter's fully really rich in this kind of data, um, and so you, you know and they have an open API, which is really great. Uh, and now connect that with what Jamie was doing. And so you can see where she was looking at a map of arguments, but then you can cite where the arguments came from. Now you can also come here and see who's influencing that person or institution. And do I have any problems with that? So you can move from a semantic map to a network map, right? That's pretty interesting yeah. to be able to yeah. see lines of influence. That was one of the things I asked her when we talked was, you know, oh, what if, where did the, when you look at these arguments, how do you know which ones really have weight? And, and so you could actually marry these ne networks of experts around nuclear power. So you can see, okay, this person has high mojo in this space. So I'm probably going to trust that argument more than I'm going to trust this other argument. So yeah, and, you know, and, and also this, that semantic data is really great input for John stuff, right? Because if you take the, all the semantic data of people who are coming from libraries or nuclear power or whatever, then you're going to get different kind of input into these models. Um, so anyway, that's that was the stuff that we st I started doing back, you know, uh, in the late aughts, um, sold a company to do that. Um, and then uh, about two years ago, um, this is before I heard the term meta crisis, I, I just I thought, you know, I better start working on stuff that's actually going to help thread the needle over the next few years, because I, you know, I'm wasting my time in the education space. Not that there's anything wrong with education, but I really want to work on um, on something that may, that matters. And to me, the operationalizing of these this global scale collective decision making really hasn't been done. I mean, it really hasn't been exploited. What's possible uh, with this stuff? So I decided to really just focus on 
you know, uh, empowering people to build trust trust networks and then exploiting exploiting the uh, unique decision making capacity, but also to kind of create an architecture for innovating in in decision making. So. Um, and because we don't want to solve all those problems, we just want to sort of put the the, the Lego blocks together. Um, the so uh, you know we obviously need to go up a level in, in collective uh, coordination if we're going to survive. Humanity as a whole is not going to do it in time, I don't think. But can a small subset do it? I believe it can. I think we have the tools to do it right now, and and we actually have a ready community in what I call the, the regenerative movement, if you will. Um, so let, I me, let me give a couple examples of uh, things that are very interesting in terms of what Brad's working on. First, the thing he showed where he brought up a library, for instance, and showed the connections where any connection he could go to could be the center. As he mentioned, that was old tech and we can data visualize it differently. So we could make it to where that shows up in a 3D space of the equivalent of what looks like a 3D space with whichever one you highlight moving to the center and all the one node connections being clustered around it, the two node connections, and the whole space reconfigures. That's actually every time you move to a new one, it becomes the center. So then you start to get a sense of how the flows of information actually configure themselves. You, <clears throat> oh, yeah, so, so this yeah. is um, this is the Daniel Schmachtenberger network that we did as part of the, um, the Emerge network that we were um, that we a project that I was going to talk about in a little bit, but you know, like as I mouse over, this is basically a similar kind of UX in terms of I just want to see the local network of this person in this big mass, um, and then the idea is that each one of these blue buttons becomes something you can operate on that person. You can add them to a to a, a, a domain expertise network or amplify them or or disconnect with them or whatever. Um, but that's that's a lot of what we're working on is just the what are the what are the the basic tools we need to to essentially intentionally build these kind of uh, trust networks and then start to use them. Um, and, you know, so and this so, is specifically the conference that we were at. You map right. the conference and then you put this one is putting my name at the center of conference participants. Yes, and if, no, cool. actually, it started with no. It's actually more than that. We started. We mapped uh, 150 conference attendees. They all had 500 or more connections, and so we actually ended up with 50,000 a penumbra, what we call a penumbra, the the, the uh, near adjacent people, and some of them are highly connected to those 150, like a George Poor who's connected to everybody, or somebody who's just my brother-in-law or whatever. But um, yeah, so uh, it's, it's it's actually rich. I mean, there's there's we you know this we literally can find. I don't know. I'm trying to type in my. Jamie must, Jamie's got to be in here. Uh, Joyce, there she is. And you know, there's, this is a lot of this is LinkedIn data. So um, it, LinkedIn, that's one of the points I was, I'm going to, I was going to make was that LinkedIn and Facebook, yeah, there's George, there's George Poor. <laughs> um, LinkedIn and Facebook are, are essentially one bit synapses. If, if you, if, if, if I'm a neuron and Daniel's a neuron, and I'm connected to Daniel. It's a it's one bit that says we're connected. It doesn't even it's not even two bits where he's connected to me and I'm not I'm connected to him. Uh, and that's very low fidelity. Doesn't contain any real information. So a big part of what we're working on is like how do you map how do you capture the deep knowledge that we all have in our brains about each other and who's good at what and who's passionate about what and um, and make that machine readable. That's really the the core is. If you can do that, which we believe you, you can, I mean, you just want to make it fun. Um, that's incredibly powerful because it's you take something that's completely unreadable by computers now, and you make it make it readable. It becomes really, really interesting. Um, so that's that's a lot of the core concept. Um, you know, the the uh, I'm going to skip over the global brain stuff because we all kind of have heard that argument before, but basically. The global brain we have now is Facebook, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn. And, and as my point was there was that that's, you know, a, a, a brain where the neural pathways are created by corporations for profit is not a good brain. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so what we're, um, uh, so Daniel introduced me to the Emerge Network people uh, a couple months ago, and we, we did what I, that map I showed you, um, we did that for them. And we're actually proposing to them to kind of, 
as one of the actionable things that they can do is, is what I'm calling a networked autonomous organization. It's kind of like a DAO, it's a now, it's a, it's a, a DAO with a network as a population. And, um, you know, we think that's, you know, really powerful. It can be self-owned, self-governed. It can, you know, create a lot of value in, you know, simply by intentionally making it high quality, high trust density. Um, and then, it, and it can also govern where, where that value goes when it's created. And uh, so that's essentially, you know, what, what we're hoping, hoping is going to come out of the Emerge Network is, is actualizing that. Um, and, to, and the real sort of near-term goal is, can we do a prototype of some kind of collective brain slash mechanism that is capable of tapping into this, this collective connectivity and making something out of it? And it's really all about you know, having a substrate that lots of innovation can happen on. Let me express a couple of examples for those who have not thought about the network thing a lot to just get a sense of some things it can do. So right now, if I am going to vote on a representative to represent me at my state level or federal level, uh, they're going to represent me across all topics. That makes no sense, right? It might have made sense in 1776 when the world was very simple. Um, and a kind of polymath renaissance person could know all of the technical issues of the world at the time. Um, but who do I trust to represent my views or to advance things in agriculture versus in defense versus in finance are probably different people. Like the farmer that I respect the most is probably not a good defense thinker. And so rather than a single representative, let's say rather than me go <clears throat> try to engage and craft a proposition and vote directly on every fucking thing because I just I have a job I've got stuff I got to do and you can see from Jamie's stuff how much stuff is in there right so let's say there's some topic about how should we secure the energy grid and there's another topic on what nuclear first strike policy should be and there's another one on how much food should we keep in storage and they're all really complex now I can either and we don't really want people weighing in who have no idea what they're talking about. So you might want something like Jamie's system where there's some basic test that just shows you you at least understand the info to be able to engage in proposition crafting. But let's say that rather than go through that, I could proxy my vote to somebody else. And I could get educated for free, even be incentivized to get educated and engage myself or proxy it. But who I proxy it to has to be someone else that has made it through. But they also have to be someone in my network. And they can be someone who I trust in this category that's different in this category. So I can say, you know what? I'm not going to actually weigh in and do all this thing in the farming sector. I'm going to proxy it, but not to some high-level representative that is now incentivized to do a bunch of fucked up ad campaigns, but to somebody who I actually know, one or two nodes in my network. But who I'm going to proxy it to over here is different. And here I'm going to engage directly with no proxy because I actually really care about this topic and I understand it. This is where being able to have seen networks and seen networks of trust and be able to identify basis of trust can be really valuable. You can also start to, and again, this starts to look like the spirit of democracy, but a much better instantiation of it. You can also see examples where it's like there are people who radically disagree on a topic and we're trying to figure it out, but you look at their trust networks and they both respect somebody. So then you go to that somebody to adjudicate the thing. Um, or you do a network like the one that he did of people attached to the information. And right now, all that we're focused on is where they're polarized, but is there some information in their network they both trust so we can see what does everybody agree on? And we can actually start highlighting that as a basis to now be able to decide the other stuff. So you can see there's like a lot of really important stuff about how, what do we, because the sense-making question is what information can I trust? What people, what institutions, and ultimately what decisions? So being able to see networks of trust and that are context and domain specific is very interesting. There's also some real interesting speed issues as well, because you can, you can take a large collection of people and you can quickly get a, a sense of the zeitgeist or alignment or, or, or uh, you, know, you know, consensus with just a few people weighing in because they're, they're effectively representing everyone else until everyone else uh, decides to, to participate or they, if they disagree, then maybe I better, I better weigh in. But um, it's, that's, I sort of call it extreme decision-making. I mean, I think that's what's where it's going to get really interesting is if in particular, like, um, 
if you can get a um, an intentional large scale trust network, let's say the regenerative movement. If you could, let's you know, essentially take the eMERGE network, which is already 50,000 people and just, and that's without any attempt to expand. You could expand to a couple million who are of people working around in the world of, of um, regenerative, the regenerative movement. Then, you know, they could run rings around any other, any other system for making, you know, reaching consensus, making decisions. I mean, the, my, one of my favorite applications is the idea of a wiki budget where you know, you, you take all these people who are expert in different things and get them to weigh in on what, what could be done this year for what price by whom. And, you know, you're going to reach a much faster, better uh, allocation of resources than you do than the US government does by hiring thousands of people and, you know, spending a year doing it. And, and now you can imagine <clears throat> the networks that uh, Brad is looking at having not just people and how much they trust each other, but also uh, AIs that are starting to get trained on specific things that are showing up as actors, right? So you can have irises in there and be able to see how much different people trust this particular um, info synthesizing source. Uh, also, which ones the irises trust, which is a very interesting topic. Um, and then you can start to get institutions. You can start to now have a basis for institutions to have an incentive to be able to in do things that increase their trust across larger parts of the network. Um, so you can just start to see synergy across these tools. Um, I will offer, Peter, it's an interesting idea, since the STOA is actually a, a pretty deeply connected community for online communities, more than most any that I know of, a STOA community network where the people had the choice to opt in to actually share data. Um, it could be an interesting way for people to get to know each other better and to get to see who they should ask for certain types of things where expertise lives. Um, just a, it's an interesting thing to think about a place that could do some experimentation. Yeah, and one of one aspect that I haven't shown you here is is actual decision making. You know, prototypes. I mean, we're I'm following Gill's law, which is that you know any any complex system that works started out as a simple system that works. So we're really focusing on what 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 are some simple applications of decision making that we can just start playing with and start using with all this tech these techniques. That we can then build from and so you know it's a great way to kind of ask you know get a sense of the zeitgeist of the community what's important you know what are the questions they want to ask etc so um that's that's part of what what could plug into uh something for like a stoa network peter yeah that would be that'd be great to do thank you brad i um i think we're gonna move to getting to take some questions from the audience while everybody's here and i just uh i hope this has been an interesting enjoyable introduction to a few projects i want to state quickly because i see some of the people on here there's a few other people that actually have pretty amazing related projects that are also in this community and maybe everybody doesn't even know who their friends are like in terms of what cool shit they're doing there's a guy named wealth in here who's been building a social network for uh, some period of time that has like two principles at the basis, which is human uh, attention and intention are really critical things. And so if I'm gonna engage with a social network, it should improve both of those. If I'm giving it attention, it should improve my attention span. If it has choice architectures, it will affect my intentions. It should help me get clear on what my deep intentions are and actually fulfill them. And how do we build ones that do that? So a lot of kind of humane <clears throat> tech UX in that space. We got a guy in here, um, I believe he's here, named Unjin, who has been inspired by the humane tech space enough and the problem with all of the notifications and hypernormal stimuli that he's just building a completely new laptop hardware from scratch, where it's based on for deep work, just research and writing pretty much, and doesn't have any of the other capabilities so that you have uh, maximum ergonomic UX benefit to do deep work and nothing else. And they've got funding and they're moving along well, but again, just started from like listening to these things and should I should do something. Um, there's a guy named Farzad who's in here, who has a group that is working on uh, using trust networks of people. It, it would make sense for them to talk to Brad and, uh, and want to get into AIs, it would make sense for them to talk to John to be able to curate existing content uh, with a very different curatorial platform. How do we 
take the very best content that currently exists and make sure that that's what shows up in your newsfeed aligned with your interests. These are all pretty awesome projects and they're almost certainly quite different than they'll look five years from now. But uh, I would love to see a builder's guild. And I think Stoa could help with this of the people who are inspired by the problems of collective coordination and collective sense making and inhumane tech and attention capture and are trying to solve stuff because can probably share knowledge and resources with each other. I think it'd be very easy to make it a just little builders guild where the people have access and can talk to each other and share messages. Um, I also just want to acknowledge one of the coolest sense making projects I know of happens to be the STOA. And it meets a similar criteria that Peter set it up in a very similar way. But if you think about the total amount of knowledge that has been shared here and epistemology upgrades where people can sense make better and network connectivity, I think it's an amazing example. And I'm bringing it up because like maybe building AI or building network tools or building libraries doesn't happen to be your thing. Maybe building communities is. There's a bunch of different ways to look at how someone can get inspired and uh, start to build stuff. So without uh, any further ado, I would love to see if there are some questions and maybe Peter, I'll ask you to help us with this part. <clears throat> and questions hopefully for the people who presented. Thank you for that, Daniel. And thank you, uh, um, uh, Jamie, John, and Brad. Everyone just give a, a round of uh, applause. <laughs> give them some love in the chats as well. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, uh, it's gonna be hard to choose, but I'll try to get one question for each person. Um, Ariel, you had a question for, for Jamie, uh, if you can ask your question. Hi, um, yeah, it was actually my question. I was, I was wondering for Jamie, first off, it sounds super like awesome and very powerful. And I was wondering how you, how you decide kind of what's in the Overton window of the arguments that you're mapping here. Like, does, does this include things like arguments that religious groups would make, conspiracy theories, um, like countercultural, like fringe arguments or, yeah, how does that go? I love that you asked this question. Thank you so much, Ariel. Okay, so um, as a library, and many people may actually not know this, but libraries have a long tradition in the United States of being pretty radically anti-censorship, which is really interesting in the existence of today's context of, you know, uh, the internet, if we think of that as a, a library, it's not confined in a building or a budget or like space on bookshelves. There's just infinite knowledge. So like, where do librarian principles meet the internet age where they don't necessarily need to be forced to make decisions that aren't necessarily censorship, but they have to prioritize certain books over others. So we thought a lot about this. And um, to answer your question more directly, the Society Library is pretty radically inclusive of argumentation. We believe that like it's our duty to just collect this collective argumentation and knowledge and then put that in the context of deliberation. So while libraries have chosen a specific ontology that is the Dewey Decimal System, the Society Library has created its own ontology, which is actually something that is derived representative, representatively from the data itself. So how we do our whole process is we gather knowledge, we deconstruct it down at the claim level, and we've actually built our own unique search engines to overcome our own biases, to overcome our own like inherent Overton windows. So we look in specific areas of the internet across different forms of media to make sure that we're as radically inclusive of all points of view as possible. And a part of the work that we do too is investigating those conspiratorial rabbit holes and chasing it down. Because what we find is that, and I think Daniel has spoken about this before, when we interact with a claim that someone's making on the internet, internet, it may sound like completely wacky out there, makes no sense, they provide no evidence, it just doesn't sound logical or reasonable. But if you actually take time to start doing some investigative work, you may find that the person who just expressed that was not the best representative of that idea. But there are there is sound knowledge to be found that is related to that specific idea. So the work we do in steel manning it is to find that really robust knowledge. Um, I'm kind of ramp rambling, but I can give a concrete example, like Alex Jones, for example, he got super famous from that quote of like, I'm tired of them putting water in 
uh, or I'm tired of them putting chemicals in the water to turn the, the friggin' frogs gay or something like that, which is an insane claim to make. But if you do a little bit of digging, you can find that there's some studies from UC Berkeley, which is right near where I live, about how the chemical atrazine is introduced into water and turns frogs hermaphroditic, which is not the same thing as gay, right? But what the Society Library does is we give people a lot of grace, especially on unscripted, audio and video to be mistaken in the way that they're expressing something, but to them be an imperfect represent, like representative of an idea itself. So the work that we're giving to society is we're just listening to what everyone has to say and then doing the work of saying, is there sound evidence and knowledge behind what people are really upset about? So we include emotional appeals, we include religious arguments, we include things that on the surface seem absurd or conspiratorial, and we do the work of steel manning that, and then also putting it in the context of contrary argumentation. So if something is contested, it'll receive a little tag like you like you saw on my, my demonstration. So people know, you should know this is like heavily contested. So don't just stop reading here and like get the impact of just having read it on your mind. You need to unpack the specific area. Doesn't Jamie inspire you thinking about politics? Like if you could actually make something that is a meta institution that is embedding these principles, like you can hear so much of the stuff we've talked about in terms of good quality sense making and steel manning with good faith of the people's arguments and being able to take multiple different perspectives and weight them. She's like, all right, well, let's actually institutionalize that and not just think about it on our own. And then let's actually make the process transparent. And then let's actually make government use it and be able to then even have accountability of whether representatives of government are using it or not. It's, it's pretty exciting. Daniel, thank you so much for being such an excellent communicator, by the way. I super appreciate you getting to know all of our projects and lending your amazing uh, articulate abilities to bridge the gap. So thank you, by the way. Yeah. Amen. All right, we got more questions. All right, uh, thank you, Katie. Um, Stephanie has a question for John. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Yeah, but I, I just want to just respond to the last. I feel very inspired by Jamie. And thank you for integrating all the, you know, the partial truths, all the gems that are out there wherever they come from. I mean, just in general, this whole presentation is such a great reminder that we have no idea what we're capable of. <laughs> thank you for reminding me that we have no idea what we're capable of. Um, all right, for, for everybody John. Who doesn't know, I just I'm going to say real quick. Stephanie mm -hmm. works uh, at Center for Humane Technology with uh, Tristan Harrison Crew as a friend. Works on these topics, but one of the projects she did, kind of where John is like, "Damn, generative text is getting so good. It's going to be used for nefarious purposes. Let's actually get out there and do something good with it." Stephanie did an early project where she made some deep fakes called Deep Reckonings. If you haven't seen it, everybody should go check it out. Where she made like a deep fake of Trump apologizing for things and Zuckerberg saying what Facebook should really be and how he's going to fix it to just like get a sense of like, oh, that's the conversation we really love to see. It's really, it's a fun project. Stephanie, please Thank continue. You. Okay. But I definitely, I tried that in the spirit of Jamie. Um, yeah, it's like, what is the thing that Kavanaugh could say that the largest ideological diversity of people could get on board with is the challenge I gave to myself. Had I had the society library to, to draw from, that, that that actually would have been incredibly helpful. You could GPT-3 deep reckonings using the society library. Okay, anyway, John, um, I have two questions for you. You can choose um, mm -hmm. one or the other or both. Um, one is, I'm just curious what you would say as to... Uh, yeah, what what questions Iris can't answer yet that you mm -hmm, think mm -hmm, Iris mm -hmm. will be increasingly able to answer? And then just what, what can you say about Iris's interaction with other forms of intelligence, AI, human, non-human, animal, every, otherwise? Yes, thank you. Um, God, sorry, it's, ask the question one more time just to let it sink in again. Oh, what, what questions can Iris not answer that okay. you think Iris will increasingly be able to answer? And then just about Iris's interaction with other forms of intelligence of all kinds. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, for the question. The, the primary thing is something that both Jamie and I agree need to be brought into these models, which is sourcing, right? Like you can have it write an article and it will make a lot of sense and it'll like break down all of this information and you'll say, cite it it will just make up people's names, right? Like I would like to know when I'm reading it some level of explicability, right? I like to dive down, like why was this said? Who is this sourced from? And, 
And also, uh, I would like some consistency uh, back from it about how confident it was about certain claims, right? I would like it to say like a claim, like how confident are you that this is true? And each time it would come back with like, oh, 65% based off of all these things that uh, I've heard from all of these people. Those are the type of questions that are not consistent yet um, because it's not baked into the model and because the design of viruses has those things baked into the architecture when they actually get built out the way I see it or envision it, um, they'll be a lot better at that explicability thing. Maybe I explain like why uh, are you saying this relative to who originally said stuff? The question about um, the interfacing, uh, yeah, so there's, I played around with you know, you can obviously have uh, models talk in natural text too, um, just back and forth to each other. We've, we've played with that with different irises and it's very interesting to sort of see how these knowledge bases interact. But there's this process, which I actually don't write about in the Purple Pill uh, manifesto at purplepill.vision about how they actually exchange information because it's, uh, it's this process of parameter exchange where like two different communities who have this local shared knowledge, they form some written declaration of like the shared information that they feel comfortable sharing with each other, right? And then both of those models will create their own or like uh, bring up that same piece of text in each of their models, uh, bring up how it's representing that in the parameters, right? And then update their parameters towards each other so that uh, there's this, uh, alignment between how the models are representing uh, information. So that's sort of this underlying uh, way that they can integrate with each other in a safe way, exchange types of information that are valid between committees while also allowing the sort of privacy that you can get from uh, an individual iris. Like one of the amazing things about the iris is that while the information is in that latent space, the parameter space, like we can't interpret it. So it's like, it's unextractable. It's perfectly hidden until it goes through the decoder side of the network. And that allows you to evaluate all of these different views in a very, um, including views of other irises in a very anonymous way. You know, you don't know who exactly was the source of it, but you can evaluate it uh, without the source of it influencing you, even though, yeah, sorry. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, yes, and it seems like, I don't know, it's like, especially with the telescope new, you know, the photos, it's like, I don't know, this feels like very much a source of all kinds of communication with intelligence of all kinds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to uh, transform human society faster than any technology in the history of the world by so much, no one's prepared for it at all. Yeah. So we have uh, the last question for Brad uh, and Kim, if you can ask the question, the question. Yeah, kind of tracking on just what you just said, Daniel is, uh, I mean, these are awesome, <laughs> first of all, just amazing. And, and so what's the application and where might we do this? I can see obviously public academic uh anybody who's interested in these subject jiving in you know and doing this and how might it be used in government like just government today uh how might they and what would be the inroads into making this an actual use any of these it's all, all of these actual use where they're using much more informed information for decision making well one of my favorite um, applications is in uh, resilient cities because there's a lot of money that's kind of sitting on the sidelines or, or being invested in by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Rockefeller, etc. The cities have lots of money and they all want to get to net zero and um, but the cities get bogged down in their internal politics and who has the purse strings on what, right? So one of the visions is that there could be a kind of a SWAT team network of urban policy people who are independent of cities, it's like an asset, a, a resource for every city that wants them. And then each city could have a local network of people who represent different areas of expertise about transportation and poverty and access to, you know, internet or whatever. 
And those two networks could work together and do kind of like a, a participatory budget that then and present it to the city and then the city and then the city and the foundations could actually say yes we'll fund those things that you suggested so i think there's real practical ways of kind of breaking log jams and funding things that everybody knows need to happen but what is the best way to do it and who should do it amy did you want to add something to that since i know you've been doing it a good bit starting to engage with government yeah, um, so I can talk about how, uh, not about Brad's work, but about how we're integrating in government. I actually have a meeting tomorrow with the mayor and a city council member because uh, the, essentially the process of what we do at the Society Library is identify stakeholders, gather relevant knowledge across media types that have to do with stakeholders, extract arguments and claims and structure that content. So currently we already build uh, political decision-making models for the city council level. And we essentially execute our process, but on a much smaller scale, because we're not dealing with big broad topics and a democratic representation of all points of view on that topic, and then doing the work of steel manning them. But instead, like for example, we had a city come to us and they wanted to know if they should put a measure of how to change change their uh, you know, voting districts on the ballot. And they thought it was a binary decision. We showed them there was 25 different dimensions to the decision. And we built a model that allowed them to move step by step. We've also deployed our techniques to uh, develop legislation. So we were contracted to take hundreds of pages of legislation and or hundreds of pieces of legislation and hundreds of pages of congressional recommendations, deconstruct them both down to the claim level and then pattern match, just essentially see if we were to just invest trust in these congressional recommendations as like having been derived from the best sense making and most informed decision making conclusions about this issue, then what's missing in the legal code from this expertise. And we just like essentially render that as a piece of legislation in legislative language. But there are other ways in which the society library in general wants to integrate our data. So you all saw the database itself and like our first like foray into visualization, which is like for every question, there's a piece of paper and you can unpack it as much as you want. But like essentially what we have is structured data. So integrating this content into search engine results, for example, Google draws from Wikipedia's API. So if you search something, sometimes the first result is not a page, but it's knowledge from Wikipedia. And the Society Library actually won a contract from the International Fact Checking Network because we were able to show that when fact checkers take shortcuts, in their sense making process and rely on Google, which relies on Wikipedia, then everyone ends up wrong. So we're gonna be teaching fact checkers our methodology. And so one of the long-term goals of the Society Library is either integrate with Wikipedia or start integrating with search engines. So when people are searching for something, instead of getting a list of redundant information, like here are all of the news articles that are saying the same thing, you pick whatever you wanna see. Instead, they're seeing a cluster of, here's the argument you're looking for. You can unpack it like you can in the Society Library and see all those references if that's what you want, but you'll also see the connective tissue, the counter arguments, the nuance, all that kind of stuff. Also, there is a service called the Congressional Research Service um, that is run by the Library of Congress. And this is one of the like intelligence agencies that Congress relies on in order to get quick, ready, um, you know, robustly informed knowledge sets about issues. And so potentially the Society Library could also be routing our data through the Library of Congress, which could be something that our representatives at the federal level may rely on and use in their own sense-making process about policy. So, you know, we're creating this library. We're hoping to create an interface that people want to interact with. People can already share at the claim level these papers, but also the data itself can be integrated to a lot of existing platforms that already have audiences who already have needs and demands for structured, robust steel man knowledge. And just to quickly add to um, before when I said like we're radically inclusive, I just want to make sure that people don't assume that the robustness that I showed you earlier in my presentation is only because we're so radically inclusive and we just like bring in everything like I, I just really want to drill down into like we're steel manning these issues and the high level columns that you saw like all of those different nodes is like very high level summaries of collections of arguments so it's not just a whole bunch of like stuff it's like these are almost even categories of arguments that are that are filled with robust knowledge that we took the time to steel man before presenting to you so that's just important to note too thanks so as we're getting close to wrapping up here, <clears throat> if the uh, three of you would make sure that you've posted stuff in the chat about how people can follow up with you, um, how they can find your info online, and then uh, if they have something tangible to offer or engage with the project, how they should reach out, please make sure everybody has that. Um, I'm sure there are a lot more questions that we can't address here, and I hope uh, they get addressed somehow. Maybe there's uh, some good kind of follow-ups that happen uh, in the STOA. I really do like the idea of a 
Builders Guild. Uh, and I also really like the idea of a STOA network that works to try to help people with some of these tools and apply it because like, that would, that would be great. Um, thank you uh, to uh, Brad and John and Jamie and Peter and then everybody else uh, who came. And Peter, any closing thoughts? Yeah, just um, thanks again uh, for the, the panelists today. That was really awesome. And thank you, Daniel, for your endless uh, generosity and your scout's eye for these awesome projects. This uh, session exceeded my expectations and I think it excited a lot of people here at the STOA. Um, and we might have uh, further sessions like these, a uh, uh, part-time short series, perhaps called the Builders Guild. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and if you want to check out more uh, sessions at the store, you can do so here. Um, so that being said, everyone, thanks so much for. Oh, yeah, well, I actually did have one other thing I wanted to share. It was in response to the last question. I think Kim asked about how how do you get politics to engage? Because I think this is just something I'd like everybody to get um, in general. Is uh, political intelligence is a kind of intelligence that is distinct from other kinds. It's the how do I get shit to actually happen intelligence. And it's one of the reasons that I'm wanting to highlight people who started figuring out how to actually build stuff. And then the next step is how do we move from building the stuff to getting people to use it and enacting it. And it's just, a, it's a valuable thing to think about. There's like, there's kind of a, a scientific intelligence of how do I make sense of objective things and apply the right kind of measurement and philosophic process. There's kind of a, a, a values or axiological intelligence, which is how do I get clear on what people care about and why and where there are differences in values. There's kind of an interpersonal intelligence of how do I communicate effectively with people. Political intelligence is how do I get shit to happen in the world in the presence of all the log jams, invested interests and things like that. And how do I do it without becoming corrupt in the process? Um, that's the light triad side of uh, political intelligence. So when you're asking the question, <clears throat> the deeper question is, is that, and there's so many different ways to do it. So like when you're saying, how do we get these types of tools and principles enacted? We can go through the supply side, which is politicians who currently have a mandate where if you say, hey, here's a better way to do your mandate, you'd probably get reelected if you do this and you might not, not if you don't, and we give it to your um, other, you know, some other politician to do, then they're like, okay, sure, I'll do it. Or you make a tool like <clears throat> any of these tools can do what a huge staff of people did before, which means you can make somebody's budget go a lot further. So the supply side will do it because you appeal to their motive, right? Their motive is, I want to get reelected. I don't have the staff or budget to do the thing. You can also come from the demand side of how do we get the public to want the tools, right? And you then kind of drive interfaces of these. Everybody, if you're not familiar, should check out as one of the exceptional examples of a person doing a thing like this, Audrey Tang, which many of you probably know, the digital minister of Taiwan. Um, Ken Salian's project wrote a paper on her uh, work a while back, but that actually came out of a, a kind of revolutionary movement. <laughs> there were these protests, everybody was um, protesting the Taiwanese government to do some stuff differently. She was a hacker and she's like, fuck, let's just fork the government code and make it private government. We won't actually ask them to do anything. We'll just take everything the government's doing, do it on the separate platform and allow everyone direct input with better models. So much of the population started to use it that the government was forced to use it. And they took her from being a protester rebel and made her the digital minister of the new digital democracy. This was like literally just a person figuring out I can just fork the government code, do a better job and force it to get used. And it's interesting because she wasn't really appealing to an existing demand that was well formulated. It was an unwell formulated one that she was able to formulate that then kind of forced supply. So the political intelligence is something you need to be thinking about along with the what does a solution to the problem look like without enactment, right? Oftentimes you just think, well, the ideal solution if I had a magic wand would be, but then how do I enact it? Well, it doesn't do anything if I can't. And if my enactment path makes it evil, because a lot of people don't want it, well, that's no good either. So this is something that I hope people are also thinking about and paying attention to here is how do I solve problems in abstract? Then how do I actually help enact them? And that's one of the types of things that I, uh, capacity, it's a type of sense making or intelligence that I think the STOA can also help people develop. 
all right, that was uh, just important because none of these things happen if people don't actually learn how to make sure it happen. Uh, thank you, everybody. I, John, Brad, Jamie, love what you're doing. And uh, that's it for me. Thanks again, David. Thank you, everyone. Take care.